Uh, hi folks, um, welcome to Toronto Data Workshop. This week we are joined by Dr. Anne Glasker, um, who's a librarian for sociology, demography, public policy, psychology, uh, and quantitative research <laughs> at Doe Library at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she holds a PhD in sociology and demography. And this, um, in this talk, she's going to discuss a recently released report about supporting big data research at the University of California, Berkeley. In particular, uh, the report is about researcher practices and challenges across six areas. So data collection, analysis, methods, tools, infrastructure, research output, collaboration, training, and balancing domain versus data science expertise. Uh, the talk is of course, extremely topical given the environment. So Berkeley um, has a data sciences institute uh, which, uh, which is, and a big push around that. And that's been happening um, for a few years. And Toronto um, has a new data sciences institute, so we are we are newer to these issues. So we're very glad that you could join us, and thank you very much for taking the time, Anne. Well, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so our talk is entitled, or my talk is entitled, "Big Data as a Way of Life," and I will, as Rohan said, be talking about a study that we recently released. And I'm joined by my colleague Rick Jaffe, who's research consultant for the UC Berkeley Research IT. Um, I was a little okay. concerned that from my librarian position that you all might have questions that I could not answer. So um, I've had a nice intro from Rohan, but Rick, would you like to introduce yourself for just a second? Well, hi, just, um, yeah, here to support Anne. Mostly um, I work maybe more closely with the technical side and with the data security side. So those are areas in storage. So perhaps if there are questions about that, I could answer. Great. Um, Thanks, Rick. So, okay, hold on just a sec. So this is what we'll be talking about today. So we've just done some introductions and we'll just kind of get started a little bit. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the background of the study and what methodology we used for uh, accessing the data that we analyzed. Um, the themes that we developed and those were mentioned by Rohan. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Um, the context at Berkeley, because I feel like for us to, for me to discuss the recommendations, you need to know a little bit about the context of Berkeley. Um, just where did we get this quote, big data as a way of life? And then we'll move into questions and answers. Um, I am someone who likes you to ask questions since we're not too big of a group while I'm talking. So if there's something that's not clear, um, maybe, someone could be monitoring the chat, it's a little hard while you're presenting, or feel free to unmute um, if, I, if I'm not clear, but many of things might be answered in a future slide. So we'll just take it as we go. Um, so here's the sort of the background context. We were actually invited by Ithaca SNR, which as you can see in the box on the right is part of Ithaca, which is a um, research institute basically. And they were performing two studies. One was on big data and the other was on teaching data literacy. So they uh, approached our associate university librarian, Sawa Ismail, and um, she felt that it would be great for Berkeley to be involved in the big data project. So once that was decided, you know, we sort of figured out what it would take and then the team was formed. Brian Quigley is the head of the Earth and Physical Sciences Library Erin Foster has a joint appointment between research IT and the library, and she's the um, head of research data management services. And then I have the super long title that I have. So what it meant to involve, to be involved in this study is that over the course of an academic year, we interviewed 16 big data researchers at Berkeley. And we had a definition, which you may be familiar with, um, by the way, um, I'm happy to send out, or Rohan can send out the slides afterwards, which have links. So the definition here is linked if you wanna see it. Um, but we were looking for volume, velocity, and variety. And some definitions include veracity. Um, and the idea was just to sort of take a close look at big data at Berkeley. We felt that that had not really been um, done in an explicit way before. And we wanted to see how the library in particular could support big data researchers and who our partners might be in that effort. Um, there's a national discussion as well, and Ithaca is leading that. And so that was kind of a, a motive as well. Um, Ithaca 
provided the structure and the timeline and some methodological training, not, I wouldn't say complete methodological training, but enough to sort of get going with. I have to say, you, you cannot overestimate the usefulness of someone else giving you deadlines. So it was um, quite a bit of work. If you ever get asked to do it, it's a lot of work and it's great work, fascinating work, important work, but it would be very easy to be in the middle of your regular job and not get to it unless you had these deadlines. So that was one big plus about working with Ithaca. So this kind of lays out the timeline. So you can sort of see, you know, we kicked off the, the project and at their suggestion, interviewed stakeholders on campus, which was very helpful because we weren't doing a sort of um, organized call for people to be interviewed. We actually were targeting people that we knew did big data research. And the way that we found their names was by interviewing stakeholders. Um, they also gave us a really good picture of the landscape. So Ithaca gave us the list of questions to ask, but if you don't know why you're asking the question or how people are operating in the environment, you may not know where to probe that kind of thing. So it was really helpful to interview the stakeholders. Um, we did do an IRB, um, did our interviews, transcribed the interviews. Um, I'll talk a little more about the themes and transcripts. And then the final report was just re released last month. So the methodology we used, as you know by now, was qualitative methodology. And I am calling it grounded theory light. So um, classic grounded theory for doing a qualitative analysis includes these three uh, processes. So open coding, axial coding, and extracting a theory. Um, so we really pretty much only did the first one where you um, analyze the content line by line and identify themes. Um, ideally, what you would do is continue and have kind of an iterative refinement of your themes and then actually um, extract a theory about the phenomenon you're researching. But we were not, open, yeah, we were not asked by if it could to do that and we did not do that. It, it still was a really, really useful approach, I thought. Um, as I mentioned, it was a convenience sample we did semi-structured interviews, which uh, the interview schedule was provided by Ithaca, but we were allowed to um, adjust it to our needs. And I can talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, we did transcribe the interviews that was done by uh, a student that had been trained by a colleague of mine and I for another project. And she was a fantastic transcriptionist. Um, it was helpful that she had some experience because these interviews, had a lot of vocabulary that could be very challenging to transcribe. So if you're, you know, imagine that you're someone that is not a data person and you're listening to these terms, like what's a GPU, what's a TPU, what's a condo, what's a this, what's a that. So we had to do some educating of her after the interviews for her to be able to transcribe. Um, and then the trans transcripts were de-identified so that you couldn't tell who was saying it because some of the content of the interview is very identifying. Um, we did use qualitative data analysis software, came upon the, the six themes that we extracted. I can talk more about that if anybody's interested, and then coded. Once we had the themes, then you go back through all the transcripts and you look for instances of that theme. So this is who we interviewed. Um, we were explicitly instructed by Ithaca to try to have as much diversity both across discipline and rank as possible. But when you're not doing kind of an organized huge sweep for people to interview, there's only so much you can do really. So we were actually pleased with these distributions. And I in particular was very pleased to see as many social sciences people as there were because I just feel like um, it's such a good contrast with the more hard quote unquote sciences. I don't like those terms, but it's a shorthand. I think you know what I mean. Um, so these were the themes that in the process of extracting the themes, what I think the word that um, a qualitative researcher would use is emerged from the data. Um, so none of these will be surprising, but 
I think part of the value of the study is that they were extracted using a kind of organized and rigorous process. So rather than having to say, well, we think this is what's going on, I can say to you, based on our research with these people at Berkeley, this is what they expressed is going on. So it just gives it a little more gravitas, if you want to call it that. So we had these six themes, and I've kind of included the sub-themes if you want to cast your eye over them while I'm um, talking, but I'm going to sort of visit each one. Um, the one that was kind of interesting, though, that I'll mention is this balancing domain expertise and data science skills. And that was not something that Ithaca included in their uh, structured interview list that they gave us. It was something that sort of, I cannot tell a lie, sort of started to emerge in some of the early interviews. And we, kind of me, tacked it on as a question in later interviews. And it, it was just, to me, one of the most fascinating kind of dualities and tensions that came out of what we did. Um, so we can talk more about that later too. But just to move through the themes, I'll try not to kind of, um, you know, sort of sit there on them, but it's, it is interesting to consider each one. So data collection and processing. So you're gathering, acquiring, capturing the data. Um, it was uh, very interesting, especially the social scientists, I think, um, did the most pivoting of anyone that we spoke to because we were interviewing people during COVID. And so it was kind of a complicated time to be asking people about their research processes because everybody was kind of at sea um, and people were told they could talk about what they did before or what they were doing while we were interviewing them. But the social scientists often had pivoted in order to study COVID in particular. And some of them were saying that because of COVID, their access to some previously proprietary data had changed. So they were actually able to get at some stuff they hadn't been able to get at before. So I will say that, um, again, as a social scientist myself, it was super fun to talk to the social scientists and see how like excited they were at, at some of the um, data collection that was happening during COVID. But in, we, you know, this, is, this theme was in general for all researchers. Then um, after the data has been sort of collected and decided on, um, actually when I say decided on, that's kind of more of a social science thing, created, whatever. Um, then there's the methods and tools and infrastructure to actually analyze it. So this quote, um, to me, it just kind of encapsulates the, the true complexity of what it means to be putting together a project and analyzing big data. So there's so many steps here and there's so many different resources that this researcher is using and it's coming down to their laptop in the end, but only after several iterations and presumably connections with staff and presumably resource gathering. I mean, are they using campus research resources for this or have they paid for their own computing cluster? I mean, there's so much here. Um, in a way, I feel like this is maybe the most challenging part for those of us that provide services. Uh, research outputs. So we talked about um, how people disseminate and publish and communicate their information, data sharing and open data were big uh, topics of discussion. Um, a lot, many people talked about the scholarly network um, one point that we made is that no one ever said, ever, I do this, I do this, I do this. It was always, we do this, my team does this, my collaborators do this. By the time that you're working with big data, you are not working alone. So um, I'll leave it at that. Um, and so then that actually leads right into the next theme, which is collaboration. So how are people using their teams? How are they using internal networks? How are they using external networks? So we were very interested in hearing about people's uh, team compositions. Um, we did have people that said that they actually managed a team and didn't do the research directly quite so much themselves. Um, they would often have large teams, including staff researchers, which were 
we didn't really focus on as much maybe as we should have. Uh, postdocs, graduate students, undergraduates, we um, did identify kind of the pivotal role of graduate students um, because they are still in a position of learning and needing mentorship. They're kind of, if you want to call it a hierarchy, which again, I don't really like that. I see it more as a network or web, but they are still needing their resource intensive. You know, we're putting research resources into them, but at the same time, they're doing a lot of the work. They're bringing the the latest knowledge back to the team and they're teaching undergraduates. So they're sort of in an interesting pivotal role that we thought maybe could be sort of recognized and acknowledged and addressed more. Um, and then this quote that you can see was an interesting one that people felt that sometimes they had better external connections than internal. Um, and that is sort of something to think about for future. And then training, um, another, as you would expect, very important theme, gaining competencies. Um, and I think, you know, several people, more than one talked about trying to drink from a fire hose. It's the, the methods are changing so quickly. Um, even like I, we had one researcher that was sort of saying, well, I only know an older dialect of R. So do I try to learn a new dialect of R or do I teach my students with the dialect that I know that I'm competent in that I know works for me, but is that doing them a disservice because they're supposed to be going out into the, oh, sorry. They're supposed to be going out into the world with like the latest thing. So, you know, even at that level, um, we did have a researcher say, the thing I actually really need training in is project management. So that was a little bit of a surprise, but um, you know, makes sense when you think about it. Um, but how can, researchers keep up with this deluge of information. And then when it's big data, you add to that the question of, um, are they, the, the whole like data skills and the actual technicalities of doing the analysis with data sets of the size that many of them are considering is a whole nother range. Um, so you can see on this slide, again, the pivotal role of graduate students in this quote. And then this kind of, I think, super interesting um, domain knowledge and data science skill, duality, tension, balance, whatever word you want to use for it. Um, and I should back up and say that many of our researchers said that they had never had training in big data. So it just kind of came upon them in the course of their career and they picked it up as they went. And so, and there's also, I'm sort of, I can see that my hand is sort of drawing a continuum. When does it become big? So when are you moving from just regular data analysis that any social science or physics or whatever discipline should, you know, what methods should you just know if you're going out into the field versus moving into big data and having to learn specific techniques because of the size of what you're working with. Um, and so often, big data researchers are having to get methodological consultation. And so you can see in this first quote, you know, <coughs> excuse me, I can't find a package that's gonna let me analyze this data and do the statistics that I need. I need, I have analytic complexity, so I need to work with a statistician who will not have the domain knowledge. But I really, um, I was saying to Rohan, I'm a former public health epidemiologist. I was, that's what I did about a decade before I became a librarian. And this bottom quote really speaks to me because it's really easy to throw modeling at a data set and it's super tempting. And back in the day when I was learning about this stuff, you just didn't do it. You did not data mine. It, it was, you know, you, you went in with a hypothesis and you worked with the hypothesis. Um, things are very different now. Um, several of our, the people that we interviewed said, well, you know, that hypothesis driven research is really not as much of a thing because we have so many more possibilities methodologically and with the amount of data we have and the kind of data we have that there's a lot more we can do. But the idea of throwing a model at something where you're not getting the underlying concept. So in this case, it's how diseases are spread. If you're not applying the model to the correct concept, and this person was sort of saying some of these 
papers are driving government decisions because it's tempting. You can produce them quickly and it's tempting. So there's a lot in this area that I think is fascinating. Um, so now I'm just gonna move quickly. I have three slides on the Berkeley context so that when I move into the recommendations, which um, is generally what people are most interested in, um, you, you sort of know what we're looking at. So we do have a list in the report of the tools that were mentioned by researchers that are used on the Berkeley campus. And as you might imagine, Jupyter Notebooks is, um, and Python, Python was the most often mentioned, but Jupyter Notebooks were actually developed at Berkeley. And so it's a very uh, highly used tool. Um, and so this is the slide where I may call on Rick and or Ken, but I'll do my best. So because I don't get as deeply into these topics from my library position, um, but it's important to know like what the options are for storage and backup. So at this point, B Drive is part of the Google suite and Box is another cloud storage option. Um, and you can see here, there are some caps and some, when you're a person that's producing a petabyte a day, and we did speak to people like that, you know, a five terabyte maximum file size is just not gonna cut it. Um, and, you know, that's not any sort of disparagement of Berkeley, but it's just, what do you do if you're that researcher? Um, there is a question of whether the data have any sensit sensitivity, not quite the right way of putting that, but you get what I'm saying is what classification do they fall into as according to um, personal health information where you see PHI, HIPAA, that's, is it personal health information or protected by the HIPAA Act, which health information portability and something, something. Um, P4 is our classification for the most sensitive data. So Berkeley does have this bullet point, secure research data and compute platform, which is for sensitive data and which um, has protected storage, allows you to work on a virtual machine and includes high performance computing. So it can be a great option for people. Um, I don't know, Rick and Ken, if you wanna comment at all on it. Maybe well, not. just to say that um, on my part, B drive and box, you know, they're not the best in terms of moving large amounts of data. It's really difficult. Um, but, and this is across all of higher ed in the last year, both of them have moved away from unlimited storage. So all of a sudden there are costs involved, renegotiations, and we're trying to move, trying to find other storage. Um, but storage is, you know, it's not cheap. It's, so that's yeah. the, one of the biggest issues we're facing now. Yeah. And so we did have researchers that were sort of saying, it's cheaper for me to set up my own cluster. And that's kind of what you don't want as an organization that's looking for a unified approach, you don't want tons of little clusters across campus, but it's a very rational decision on the part of that one researcher. And so where do you go with that whole picture? Um, and again, as Rick said, that is not unique to Berkeley for sure. The other resources, um, the spa accounts, and every time I see that, it's like, oh, a spa, but it, it's actually special purpose account. And so that's a way in which um, a unit can have a, an account and storage without it being tied to a particular person's account so that if that person leaves, the team does not lose access. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we do talk to people about repository selection and Berkeley is a member of Dryad, which is um, a repository that is means that, you know, it's free for Berkeley folks to use. It does have a 300 gigabyte maximum deposit limit, although you can have as many deposits as you want, but that still might be a little bit of a, a barrier for some big data researchers. And then just in case you're looking at the slides later, I have a list of tools um, that come from our research data management site. If you just wanna see what other things are offered at Berkeley. And then um, just wanna talk a little more about high performance computing. Um, if you wanna take a look at this later, I'm not gonna read through this orange box, but the orange box appears in the report. So you'll be able to find it there too. Um, we only have five research. I'm a little surprised I'm putting that judgment on only five. Um, I would have thought there would have been more, but we didn't ask about it specifically. So it was something that like we looked for afterwards to see, well, who did mention this? So we did have five people saying that they mentioned high performing, 
high performance computing. Um, and you can see uh, Savio is the one that's referred to on the left here, named for the free speech movement activist, Mario Savio, I just think is really cool. Um, and the National Energy Research, I can't see because the Zoom window is blocking it, but NERSC is at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And then someone created their own cluster. So this is a big um, area of interest in terms of thinking about where to move forward with big data as a way of life. And may I jump in real quick? Please, please. You know, so a lot of the high performance computing is, is machine learning kind of things. Um, but two interesting sort of humanities based um, uses of high performance computing are, are photogrammetry, three dimensional modeling of, of stills, and also uh, optical character recognition, so texts. So it's not only in the, in the STEM fields that people use high performance computing. Thanks, Rick. Um, and I don't know if you meant if you saw that we um, actually did interview two people in the arts and humanities. One of them we sort of felt was like maybe a little bit on the edge of are they using big data or not. Um, they were using many, many different data sources and combining them, but the other one was absolutely a big data person. And so that's kind of it was kind of great to be able to talk to them too. So let's move on into the recommendations. Um, this is just a screenshot from the report. Um, so the first set, um, and I have the recommendations on the left, and you, you know, if you want to kind of revisit them in the report or whatever, they're there. But um, the first one was to have a third place to encourage and support data cultures and communities. And if you're not familiar with what I mean by third place, it's very common in the library literature. It was kind of a concept that was created by Ray Oldenburg in the 70s, or I'm not completely sure, but um, libraries are often referred to as third places. So rather than formal workplaces or places of worship or whatever, they're more like informal gathering places. So coffee shops, outdoor plazas in some places with nice weather, but libraries tend to be that same thing in informal gathering places. So that's what we mean by third place. Um, actually, of all the recommendations that we've heard people come back to us about, this third place idea was the one that seemed to really engage people's imagination. Um, so that makes me proud as a librarian that that you know, feels like a, a relevant kind of way of thinking of these issues. The highlights of this set of, re of recommendations are to kind of really keep in touch with people in the moment. Um, so a lot of this is networking, really. Keep in touch with people in the moment, um, have creative partnerships, be sure that we're reaching across disciplines, sharing resources. We did have one um, uh, interviewee that I, I wouldn't characterize it necessarily as completely cranky, but he was just a little bit like, you know, I give the university all this overhead and where does it go? Um, and, you know, and so maybe a little more transparency too, but certainly resource, resource sharing, what happens to that um, that could be kind of better leveraged across campus. Um, we actually listed as a recommendation physical spaces specifically um, to, to kind of enhance this gathering uh, idea. And then we felt that campus really should have a data mission statement. It's not that we necessarily think this will happen, but just the idea of, do we really know what we want to achieve and what we think is important and what our values are around data? And we wanted to um, explicitly incorporate justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion concerns. Um, there's, a, there's a big, we can talk about this if anybody's interested, um, but there soon to be a building and set of services called the gateway. And it's going to be a physical space, but also a kind of conceptual space of infusing data throughout campus. And so we wanna be sure that equity is included in that development of that. Um, the next, as you can imagine, is the pain point of the computing and data storage infrastructure um, because big data is kind of its own beast and how do we kind of expand again so that it can be a way of life and so that we can attract people that are already doing big data research or want to do big data research. 
So um, the first bullet point here, the benchmarking, refers to the fact that uh, B drive and box are starting to put on limits and the costs will change. And so what does campus want to provide that, that will be available to everyone in terms of storage? Um, we want to give people incentives to use the condos, the Savio that we, in that orange box before, and the um, secure research data and compute service and not create their own clusters. But what would that look like? What, you know, on an individual basis where people are deciding what to do, what would the incentive look like? And then um, one of our recommendations is just that um, it, and this is kind of a classic Berkeley thing. I feel like I came here from the University of Washington, um, which was kind of a, a different culture in a different setting. But I, I think it's such a classic Berkeley thing to have lots and lots of little siloed innovator people and they're super brilliant and they've been doing like super cool things for decades, but it creates silos. And so it's, you end up not having a unified approach to some of these issues. And so we felt that there, as, as much as we could, there should be kind of a unified and streamlined approach. I just remembered I said all of that and this is being recorded, but I guess it's okay. <laughs> um, and then the, the next thing is strengthening communications. And so I, I just have to say how kind of amazing it was that we were sort of sitting in the interviews and people were saying, well, you know, campus doesn't have this and campus doesn't have this. And we were like, um, yes, we do actually. And there's this cool thing and let me send you a link and I'll help you after the interview connect to it. So it was very obvious to us that people just had no idea. And here we were trying to get the word out. So what's the gap there? And how can we make sure that people aren't um, missing out on things that would really help them do their research more effectively? So one is to orient new faculty, and we've already taken steps towards that. Um, another is to, again, we keep saying this, but it's still true, partner with stakeholders and do outreach, but to try to do it in ways that it's not like another email from the library. They just keep sending me emails, but something that like really will engage people and kind of meet them where they are. Um, and what would those targeted communication avenues look like? And people talk to us a lot about um, where they look and quite honestly, Twitter is a very much used place for finding um, research results, methodological advances, that kind of thing. Like it sounds odd, but I mean, is that the kind of thing we could leverage if that's where people are? And then um, coordinating and developing training programs. So there's that whole just feeling overwhelmed by how much needs to be learned and how much there is to learn. Um, so our first point is that this, you know, this was a library sponsored report. We feel very much connected to these issues and, but not all of our staff feel comfortable working with them. And so how could we increase that comfort? So we have more people to help us with the initiatives and to help the researchers. Um, so we've just launched a library data services program, which would be like a perfect way to coordinate training. Um, we do believe that training should be targeted towards graduate students and postdocs, perhaps more than it already is. We could sort of look into that more, but um, because the researchers were telling us, I can't, I don't have the bandwidth to go do these trainings, but my graduate students and postdoc students. So we send them out and then they come back with the information. So that might be an audience that would be both effective and more reachable. And then there is a, a data science certificate for undergrads, but we wondered about the possibility, and this is kind of just pie in the sky, of a certificate that was targeted at grad students, postdocs, et cetera. Um, now I did include this one slide, which I thought just as a little point of interest that the way Ithaca set up the 21 teams or 22, I just don't remember, but something like that. Each team had a kind of companion team. So in this setup, Berkeley and UC San Diego were paired. UC San Diego's respondents were pretty much mostly in the STEM fields and they have a medical school. Berkeley does not. Berkeley has a very good school of public health, but uh, the medical school is in San Francisco, um, UC San Francisco. Um, so their kind of results, their report was different. And these are, this is online available to see. Um, so if you want to 
connect with it, I can certainly put you in touch with it. Um, but I just thought it was interesting that there were some things that were just the same. Even though we are different as institutions, um, they had a theme and we did too, the research data processes sharing, data sharing and openness. Um, the infrastructure for big data support, the, the idea that researchers don't know what's out there and cost. Um, they also identified issues with communication channels and they also identified training needs for researchers. So there's a lot of alignment, even though we're very different institutions. Um, and so here is our favorite quote of all the quotes. And I'll let you just take a second to read it. Um, so hopefully you kind of have the, the gist of it, but this researcher basically was saying, we're kind of behind. We're, we're running as fast as we can and we're, we're doing our best, but it's kind of like it's a tsunami and the, the need and the interest and the kind of movement in many of our disciplines is moving towards big data and if we want to be a few steps ahead, which as Berkeley is kind of our goal, we have a lot of gap to fill. So he's just sort of saying it should be just an everyday thing. There shouldn't be any of these questions that we're all asking. Again, nothing about Berkeley. We're all asking these questions. How can we get to the point where it's just a way of life and worrying about capacity and those kinds of things is just not an issue. Um, so that's kind of it for the content. Um, just in case I left this slide in, this was from another presentation, but in case you're interested in how we're disseminating our findings, we did a presentation to the library community um, back in July, which was super helpful because we got a lot of good ideas for our recommendation section, which we had not crystallized yet. We've released the final campus report. Um, instead of an executive summary, I did a blog post, which is sort of like an executive summary. Um, they didn't tell us we had to, so we, <laughs> we were pretty tired at that point. Um, we did a presentation in the UC Libraries Forum, which was like a mini University of California conference. And then we're hoping to present at the Data Curation CKG sometime soon. So that's what I have. I'm very, very grateful to Rick for joining me today. Um, and you you are welcome to put him on the spot in the questions and answers um and me too so thank you very much thank you for your for being here and for your attention and any questions thank you very much and um i'll just record this first question um which is one that we ask everyone and then i'll share a question period more generally that will not be recorded but the first question okay. is um are there any books uh that you recommend folks read um and as a librarian and a phd i imagine this is a hard question for you uh, but... well okay so i cheated because rohan told me that you'd ask me this question and you know, I'm sort of compulsive about my slides and I'm a librarian and I love books. So here we go, I have a slide. So here's my slide with the books. Um, so they go from left to right in terms of, do they have really data focus? And also the two left are nonfiction and the two right are fiction. Um, if you have not, I, I'm just feeling like probably everybody's seen or heard of data feminism. Are you pulling it off your shelf? <laughs> It's such a good book. I cannot recommend it highly enough because it just takes the things that we all think about related to data and looks at them from a slightly different lens. And it, it's not feminism in terms of it's just women. It's feminism in terms of any ism. So who are we leaving out when we talk about data? Who are we collecting data from? How do we express it? Um, what data is missing? It has a, an, an example. Some of the examples are just, you will never forget them. There's one fantastic one. It was an art installation actually, but it was a file cabinet and, a, a, and 
it actually had the folders in the file cabinet and each one was labeled. They were empty folders. It was missing data. And each one was a data set that should be collected that is not being collected. And it, it, okay, I'll stop. You kind of have to see it, but can't recommend this book highly enough. And it's open access, so you don't need to buy it. Um, if you need the link, let me know. Then I included the manga guide to statistics because I'm a big data literacy geek. And so I really believe in, we're talking about big data, big data, big data. And is this approachable for everyone? So if it's a way of life, I feel like it should be approachable by everyone. And right now I do feel that for um, Berkeley has many, many non-traditional students. So they're first generation students or they have learning issues or whatever the case. And they've convinced themselves that data is not something that, that is theirs to approach. And if I sort of just do one thing for my career and make some people feel like, no, it's cool and I can approach it, that would be great. So this is one thing is to make the information not feel like it's a barrier. So that's why I have Manga Guide to Statistics. There's a lot more. There's Manga Guide to Physics, Manga Guide to Regression Analysis. They're very good. Um, and then Intuition is a novel about a research institution that's adjacent to Harvard in the novel where there's a question of data fraud. It's really, really gripping because it's, I don't know how, she's not a researcher herself, Allegra Goodman, the author, but I don't know how she got such a good picture of what happens in research institutions and the ethical dilemmas. It's, it's, it's a page turner. And then Gaudy Night is just a personal favorite um, and Rick likes it too, I had discovered, which made me so happy. Um, it's, it was written in the 1930s in Great Britain and um, it's about women in academia. So those are my books. And thank you for asking, that was so fun. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll stop recording now and we can get to okay. the